time on The Gadget Show. John takes Otis and me into the woods and subjects us to some extreme gadget testing. We crawl through mud to test rugged phones. We get shot at to test gadget torches. And we throw ourselves downhill to test gadget sledges. Also in this show, John tests some very neat and very sexy net boots with the help of the very neat and very sexy Julie Etchingham, you know, her off the news at 10. And I compile the Gadget Show's top five favourite bits of free software. to the gadget show. This week's lineup is a roughy tufty feast for all you roughy tufty types. That's right. For this week's challenge, Jason and I, the men of the gadget show, headed out into the harsh, wild outdoors for some rugged gadget testing. <laughs> 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 yeah, it promises to be a testosterone-filled Clash of the Titans-esque yeah. show today with our fit and athletic Otis and my lovely wee Jason. Hey, <laughs> hang on a minute. How can he get athletic and whatever it was and I get, like, wee? Because that's just what came to my mind, lovely wee Jason. He could have gone with Agile or, you know, he's quite clever but he's also good in a skateboard, Jace. Or, ooh, he's not got a bad pair of buns on him. You could <laughs> crush him up between them. Jace? I kind of thought... Of Lovely and we I didn't think of those okay, things. That's fine, no, it's fine. That's good. <laughs> yeah, Susie wouldn't have said that. I'm just, you know, just pointing that out. <laughs> For the first part of our wild challenge, we'd headed to the depths of Canuck Chase to find out just how tough rugged mobile phones can get. Otis and Jason would be going head to head, testing two of the roughiest, toughiest phones on the market. I had the Sony XP3 Enduro. <laughs> which claims to be the most waterproof phone ever made. And I had the Conduro LM801. It's tough and it's feature-packed, with a compass, altimeter, barometer, thermometer, torch, and even a laser pointer. So, two very tough phones, but what was the challenge? Now then, gentlemen, four parts for this challenge. You'll be blindfolded for all of them. They're all against the clock. First, I would guide them through a slalom course to test the sound quality of the phones. Next, they'd be crawling through a mud pit to test how well the phones are protected against muck and grit getting into their workings. You'll be getting wet, but not as wet as you're going to get over here. Note the fire engine. Then they would face the full onslaught of a fireman's hose to test waterproofness. And lastly, they'd need to throw their phones repeatedly to try and hit a high target. This would really test the phone's strength and toughness. The winner is going to be the person who completes all the tasks in the shortest possible time and still has a working phone. Jason was up first for stage one, testing the sound quality around the slalom course. Three, two, one. I headed off with John doing his best to guide me. Left, 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 right, on the on. Do you know what? It's quite tinny, actually. Left, you know, I can't actually like differentiate between left and right in his voice. Left, back, back, forward, forward. Because the phone is completely sealed to keep water out, it muffled John's voice. Turn on, turn on, light, light, light. I made a few mistakes, but eventually made it through in 42 seconds. Hang on, here we are. On to stage two, the mud test. Right. Oh, oh, my God! Where have you brought me? You're going to the left. Oh, God, it's disgusting! It just went into my pants! <laughs> my sonim is completely non-porous. So this disgustingly stinky mud, in theory, shouldn't get through the casing. Where do we go now? The phone was covered in mud, but it kept going. John guided me through, and it was on to the waterproof test. Now, the Sonim is the most waterproof phone ever. All the workings of the phone are completely sealed inside, and special rubber and plastics are used to keep the water out. The Sonim can be fully submerged for up to half an hour. Tell me, John. Because of that, I made it through the water no problem and moved on to the final stage with a fully working phone. Now... My Sonim flew confidently through the air, landing hard again and again. But it kept on going, proving its toughness. Hello, God, hello! The phone's hardened rubber casing is designed to survive a fall onto concrete from two metres. I finally hit the target and I was done. Overall, my time was 3 minutes 32 seconds and I had a fully working phone. I can hear you! A tall order for Otis to beat. Three, two, one. I went for it and it was immediately apparent that the Conduro had a much fuller sound. Go, go, go. Forward, 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 forward. Okay, he's coming through really clearly. I can hear him very well. Left, 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 left. The ease with which I could hear John saw me through the slalom and into the mud ahead of Jason's time. Right. Keep ahead straight, straight, straight. OK. 
My Conjuro has an anti-slip rubber casing, so hopefully I won't lose it, even if I myself drown in this horrible bog of stench. <laughs> oh, that's deep. Hello? Oh, <laughs> in the mouth. Not a good place. My Conjuro got covered in mud and it didn't like it. Oh, you sound so far away right now. I could barely hear John through the speaker as I got further into the mud. Luckily, I managed to hear just enough to reach the button, but it didn't look good for the water test. My Conduro doesn't claim to be waterproof, just splashproof, and the sticky, oozy mud had already caused some problems. Tidal is right, Tidal is right. You are so quiet, I can't, I can't hear you. Water had got into the foam. I could barely hear John. <laughs> And as I moved on to the final test, John couldn't hear me at all. Well, oh, well, I can't hear you on the phone, so I think it's starting to fail. But anyway, let's get on with it, because you seem to be able to hear me, so... My Conduro has a sturdy titanium casing, plus a magnesium frame inside, keeping everything in place. So not quite as hard. The casing stayed intact. Oh! But the water and mud had done its work. John got more and more faint, and I couldn't hit the target no matter how hard I tried. And I'd had enough. The phone doesn't work properly. I can't hit the target. Even though I went through the mud a lot better than Jason did, and I walked through the water better than he did, I've lost the challenge, cos the phone's gone rubbish. There's no point in playing fair anymore, is there? It's hardly worth celebrating. I didn't win. <laughs> Do you know what? Watching that brought back some really bad memories. However, on the plus side, if you're a builder and you're not going to go to the extremes, this has got some great features, including a spirit level. Oh, it's got some fantastic facilities on there. Very, very impressive. The digital compass as well is very nice. But definitely, you're one. Yeah. Jason is definitely one up on this challenge with the Sonim. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about netbooks. Ever since Asus launched the original EPC, manufacturers have been falling over themselves to produce the perfect, low-cost, ultra-portable laptop. So much so that there's now a plethora of the things to choose from. I've been spending the last month or so playing with all of this lot, and I've whittled them down to my favourite three. And in order to find out which is the best of those, I recruited the help of a top journalist. Newsreader Julie Etchingham from News at Ten is constantly on the go, from scenes of breaking news to the ITN studios, and is ideally placed to put these machines through their paces. My chosen three netbooks all fulfil my criteria of reasonable price, around the £300 mark, and reasonable battery life, a minimum of three hours. I was keen to find out which, if any, of these ultra-portables is the best choice for someone always on the go, like Julie. Julie! Hello. Hi, John. Nice to see you. Lovely to see you. Now, laptops, are they an essential tool of your trade? They are. For every sort of aspect of the job, they're useful. And so far, have you always gone for full-size laptops? Yeah, I have. And I have to say, having lugged it around on a few stories now, I'm, I'm wondering whether I perhaps ought to have gone for something a little lighter. Yes, we've got three netbooks today. So the first one we're looking at, Asus EPC, it's quite a lot smaller than a, the standard laptop. Uh, shall we go and test it with some real journalism? Absolutely. Let's go. I was going to tag along as Julie headed off to cover a David Cameron press conference in Westminster. This would provide the perfect opportunity to test the first of our three netbooks. The Asus EPC 1000H sports a 10-inch screen, a 1.6 GHz Intel Atom processor, 1 GB of RAM and a 160 GB hard drive and in our continuous-use battery test, ran for 3 hours and 18 minutes. With the press conference getting underway, Julie got to grips with the Asus. So what's your first impressions on portability and finish? Um, well, it's got very nice finish. I suspect this sort of design and style and feel is quite appealing to a female market. It's a nice bit of kit to have in your bag. Um, it's a lot lighter than the one I'm used to carrying. And actually, you know, if you're in something like a news conference where you need to perhaps be a bit more discreet, this isn't a bad way of doing it. All of a sudden, Mr Cameron arrived, the flash bulbs popped and the serious business of politics began. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my... Press Weighing in at 1.45 kilograms, the EPC is certainly portable, but I wondered how Julie had coped with that compact keyboard and trackpad as we headed outside to the news truck. How do you find it in there? Well, it, actually, it was great because it's a very discreet piece of kit, so you can tap away quite happily and making notes on what was being said in the speech. The downside, I found the mouse clip very heavy, and I think if you were using that for any length of time, that would become quite 
an irritant, really, because it just you really have to make a very definite click on it. We found the screen dealt admirably with different light conditions and coped perfectly well as Julie checked up on related news stories online. Not bad. That's very clear if you're reading it, it I think. It actually manages to punch through quite well. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So, a fair performance from the Asus, but with deadlines looming, it was time for Julie to head back to the office. So we jumped into a car and pulled out laptop number two to begin fine-tuning her report. And the next candidate is this, the Acer Aspire 1. Mm -hmm. Right. The Acer has a 10.1-inch screen and the same processor and 160-gig hard drive as the EPC. It's a little lighter at a feathery 1.34 kilograms, but performed far better in our battery test, running for over six hours. So, I mean, first impressions of the look of the Acer? Well, it looks very smart. It looks very professional, mm. um, perhaps a bit more professional than the last one we looked at, purely because it looks yeah. a bit like an office computer, I suppose. It's very glossy, sleek, black, and the weight is good too. As we headed across London, Julie got down to some serious typing with the Acer as she added her story to the evening news running order. It's a lovely keyboard. It seems very uh, speedy, nice to use. Ah, now the mouse key is a different story. It's a big shove. It, it takes quite <laughs> a shove to click on the mouse. So a thumbs down for the Acer's mouse buttons, though it performed well keeping Julie in touch with the office and that glossy screen past our glare test outside, it hadn't quite been a headline-grabbing performance as we arrived at the ITN News Studios. So this is it, the famous ITN News Centre. Yes, that's it, look, and everybody's very hard at work in there already. Mm. And this is when you come back to base and finish off the work on the story that you've been doing for the day. We'll try it on our third netbook, Excellent. the Samsung NC10. OK, let's get going on it. Our final netbook, the Samsung NC10, has a very slightly larger screen than the other two, measuring 10.2 inches, but again with a similar processor and a 160-gig hard drive. It ran for nearly five hours in our battery test. Time to subject it to the pressure cooker environment of the ITN newsroom. So what are your first impressions of the Samsung's design? Oh, it's rather nice, isn't it? I mean, hmm. it's a substantial uh, little netbook and a lovely keyboard. That's the largest keyboard, I think, hmm. of the three that we've seen, a very sort of... Mm. Flat, um, quite an appealing thing you'd want to get stuck yes. in there. I think quite a sensibly designed keyboard, actually. I mean, it wouldn't give you any calls for embarrassment <laughs> in the newsroom if you didn't have a proper laptop. No, no, in fact, when we walked in, I saw a couple of people eyeing it quite Ooh. enviously. I suspect mm. this would certainly cut it in a newsroom. As Julie perfected the script for the evening's broadcast, it seemed the Samsung's keyboard and trackpad were star performers. Crucially, after our other tests, a very nice click Ooh, with a mouse. A reasonable yeah, mouse that's button good. Movement. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Important. The screen performed well, both inside and out. That's pretty good, isn't it, if you were reading a document? After some final tweaks, the day's story was finished and ready to air. But had Julie come to a decision on her favourite netbook? So, the three, which one would you go for? Well, I think, actually, it is the third one that we looked at, the Samsung. Not least because uh, the design of it is very appealing. It feels a nice gadget to use, but also, crucially, mm. the keyboard is lovely on this. It's the biggest keyboard of the three. Yep. It's very easy to use, yep. and the, everything seems to be in the right position, and the mouse works beautifully. Mm. Good. Right, Thank I'd better get much. into the studio. I've got a few ah, minutes before excellent. on there. Good. good to see you, John. Thank very you very good. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ah, cheerio. So, Julie, I mean, she seemed to be impressed by mm. all of them, but what about your G ratings? Mm. Well, not much to choose between the three, actually. It's the little points that let some of them down. So I'd give uh, three Gs to the Asus, let down slightly by the keyboard, and mm -hmm. perhaps it's not the prettiest of the No, three. it's not, is it? Mm. And the Acer? Three Gs also for the Acer. Better keyboard, better screen, but let down by that uh, horribly stiff... Oh, she didn't like that, button. did she? No, she not didn't at, like at, all. at all. And finally, we've got the Samsung. Four Gs for the Samsung. <laughs> it's got no obvious faults, got a better keyboard, and it just sort of looks more the business, I think. So the Samsung is the Gadget Show's favourite netbook. Now it's time to return to this week's wild challenge. You'll remember in the first part of our challenge, Jason and I were both blindfolded, soaked, and made to crawl through a bog testing rugged phones. Yeah, and I think uh, you'll probably remember that I won that part of the challenge. Yeah, but you're only yeah. one up, Jason. Yeah, but I was looking to go two up in the next part of the challenge because it involved my specialist subject, personal transport devices. Now, gentlemen, you're already bruised, battered and shattered. Next, you're going to throw yourself down a hill. It's the Gadget Show's extreme downhill race. <laughs> it's a two-stage race from the top of the hill to the bottom using stand-up and sit-down off-road gadgets. Hey! I'd be tackling stage one on the No Snow Pro downhill board. It's like an off-road snowboard with wheels. And I've got the Mission Boardwalk, a scooter BMX built for downhill and dog sledding. So that's the kit. On with the race. Three, two, one. 
Get out! I got a push to make it fair, and we burst off the line neck and neck. The no snow is a record holding mountain board and is normally one of the fastest around. Way! The long deck is built for stability. <laughs> and the axles absorb all the shocks from bumps and the like. My wheels were getting caught in the long grass, though, slowing me down. No such trouble on my boardwalk. This is essentially a scooter with BMX tech. The 20-inch wheels and the heavy steel frame make for a really smooth ride, even though the terrain's quite bumpy. And the speed's incredible! I shot over the line, winning the first stage. On to stage two. For this, we were riding Tyrrell grass sledges. Awesome tracked all-year-round sleds. Three, two, one, go! It's got a sledge body and caterpillar tracks for all kinds of grassy terrain. Woo! It's also got two levers for steering left, right and for braking. The tracks run on stainless steel rails rotating 204 super tough plastic rollers on each sledge. They're quick, so quick that Otis lost control and careered off the track, taking out a pole. That really hurt. We tried again and again to get a proper race going. But in the end, we were having so much fun on our sledges, we abandoned the race and reverted to childhood, just going again and again until the sun started to set. <laughs> yes! What a ride, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> gutted. Gutted, very gutted, actually. But I've got to tell you something. You've chosen the right vehicle there. These things are great fun. Lots of bruising on the lower back, however. That's only because you have that special high-speed technique where you lie back, <laughs> centre of gravity. Yeah, I saw that. It's like you were trying to do a mini wheelie. Nice. Wasn't it? Well, it's time for this week's top five, and I've compiled a list of stuff that you can get for nothing. Yep, this is my top five favourite bits of software for free. Money, 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 money. You just think sometimes everything costs a little bit too much and before you know it, you're down to your last bit of shrapnel. Well, there is such a thing as a free ride. That is freeware. In at five, it's Stellarium, a virtual planetarium. Well, I honestly cannot tell you how exciting this is. It's like, remember the first time that you ever played with Google Earth? Well, it's like that but in the night sky. It's fantastic. Stellarium shows the skies in real time as you would see them with your own eyes or a telescope from anywhere in the world. So right now, I'm actually looking at the night sky from my back garden. So when we go out, my daughter and I in the evening, and we make a wish upon a star, I can actually find out that if I click on the star here. I'm wishing upon an HP 9884. I'm impressed by that, but I don't think I'll tell my daughter. It's not quite as magical, is it? <laughs> My number four freeware is Dropbox, a simple yet incredibly useful file-saving program. Dropbox is software made to store your files online and it's really clever. I'm going to actually finish this very important letter a little bit later on, so I'm going to put it into my Dropbox, which automatically syncs it up with my free two gigabytes of online space. There we go. Green tick tells me it's synced up, which means I can collect my letter anywhere I go just by logging onto my Dropbox. To collect your files, just log on to your account on the Dropbox website from any internet-connected computer and click on the link to download it. And there you go. There's my very, very important letter, which I need to finish, so please, be gone. At number three, it's the open source media player VLC. VLC has been around for a long time now and I've always rated it one of the top media players. It can handle almost every audio and video format without actually saying that you need this codec or that plugin to actually make your movie work. But the really fantastic thing about the new versions of VLC is that it's portable. You simply plug it in. Muscling in at number two, it's Sumo Paint. When it comes to image manipulation software, the good free ones are few and far between, but this one is absolutely brilliant. Poor Jason. It's a brand new Flash-based online programme which is fantastic as you don't have to install any chunky files or snooze through loading times. You can open pictures from URLs or even retrieve half-finished pictures from your own Sumo account. And it could be a real rival to other more expensive image software. My number one spot goes to the most talked about software of the moment, Spotify. 
Spotify is a free programme with the humble aim of making all the world's music available for its users. It's a music streaming programme with literally millions of tracks in its library and hundreds of thousands more being added each day with all the major music companies on board. You can search for tracks, add them to your playlist and keep on playing them to your heart's content. So what's the catch? Well, the free version does mean that you get the occasional advert. If you want the ad-free version, it's a tenner a month. But quite frankly, I would pay that for this amount of music. But I don't have to. Great lineup. Really good. It was a brilliant you know, lineup I, of software. I found that exciting because I mean, we are at the beginning of the free age. I mean, you know, a lot of software is, software is going this way. But uh, great choice in putting Spotify number one. Well, that's the sort of thing that I would have paid for, you know, a wee mm. while ago. So it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, who needs actually to own music when you can get it on demand, whatever you want, whenever you want? Yeah. Welcome back to The Gadget Show, and it's time for us to get straight back to this week's wild challenge. After a day of trampling through mud and getting soaked to the skin and then falling off some stuff, Jason and Otis managed to get a shower and a wee sleep. But not for long, because Sergeant Major Bentley got them up at the crack of dawn for more exercise. The morning after the night before, we were back on Canuck Chase in the beautiful dawn sunshine. But we weren't here for the views. We had a portable outdoor cooking challenge to get on with. Morning, gentlemen. I hope you slept well. Morning. morning. Such a lovely morning. I'm going to go for a walk across this splendid chase. OK. Thing is, though, walking makes me peckish. And at the end of my stroll, I'm going to need a lunch that you two have lovingly prepared for me. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you need to make your lunch is in the back of these two cars. The slight snag is that the dining area is at the end of a two-mile hike, and to test whether your equipment is truly portable, you'll need to carry it with you. See you there, John. Mm, bye. <laughs> As John rambled off, we had to pack up our kit and get underway. But what were we cooking, and what were we cooking on? I was using the Coleman Fold and Go. It's a foldable, propane-powered twin hob set, perfect for that most classic of outdoor foods. What I'm going to cook is an English breakfast. And I'd be cooking in the multi-purpose cob oven. It's just 33 centimetres high, but it can bake, barbecue, fry, roast and smoke. I'm going to go for something a little more exotic for John's lunch. A delicately cooked joint of beef and some roasted vegetables. With the food and kit packed, there was no time to waste, so we hit the trail. Over the two miles, this kit was heavy. My fold and go weighs a pretty hefty 3.65 kilos. And my carb is 3.8 kilograms. Add the utensils and food, and this was hard. My pack's so heavy, <laughs> I've got half a cow in my bag. <laughs> After about 40 minutes worth of yomping, trudging and marching, we reached our alfresco cook site. Yeah. This looks about right, doesn't it? Yeah. My eggs are broken. No, really? Yep. Told you we shouldn't have jogged. <laughs> First, we had to unpack and set up our kitchens. And as I was going for the posh nosh, I wanted to look the part. Suitably attired, I was ready to prepare my meal and get the cob lit. A fairly simple matter. That is just so good. It's so easy to light. Without a firelight or anything, look at that blazing fire. The special cobblestone bricks are made from coconut shells coated in barium and sodium nitrates. The chemical reaction makes them burn super hot, super quickly. Well, that's incredible. It took about two minutes to get rid of the flames, and now all it is is heat. With the lid on and the heat radiating from the cobblestone in the centre, the stainless steel cob works just like an oven. But by mixing it up a bit, moving the grill closer to the heat, adding water or using a frying pan, for instance, it can cook in all sorts of different ways. Look at this thing, it's absolutely fantastic. You know how hot it is because it's cooking my veg in my joint, but look, I can pick it up. I mean, and it's cold to touch. You can cook just about anything in it. You can bake bread, do pizzas, you can smoke fish, casseroles, stews in there, or, of course, delicious beef joints and vegetables. My joint was going to take an hour to cook. More than enough time for me to get my all-day breakfast on the go. OK, now, the first and great thing about the fold and go is the fact that you don't need matches. It comes with a quick start to get the two propane burners burning. OK, now we're cooking. Sorry, I had to say that. Another bonus about using propane fuel is that it works down to extremely cold temperatures. So, if you're up Mount Everest or climbing Snowden, you'll still get your fried breakfast. In fact, this camp stove will work down to a temperature of minus 42 degrees. The pure propane is good for just over an hour's cooking and is a recent addition to the fold and go. The burners can be adjusted independently and are blocked from the wind, meaning you can cook with this bad boy anywhere in pretty much any conditions. 
Both our meals were coming along nicely. And not a moment too soon, John had arrived for his meal and he brought a guest for dinner, top chef Gino De Campo. You've got the lid that is rounded, the flavour stays in there more, especially mm. if you do a roast. But on the other side, that one, you can probably do much more variety of food there. John and Gino checked out our cookers, then left us to put the finishing touches to our meals. After an hour's cooking for me and 20 minutes for Otis, we were both ready to present our dishes. The moment of truth was on us. What would the judges think? Three, two, one, and reveal. Ooh. Oh! <laughs> hey. yeah, this, is, this, this is amazing. Can you try some? Oh, yes, please. I'm not gonna feed you, I just want to. No, 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 no. <laughs> Good sausage. Thank you very much. I think these are both pretty impressive dishes, really, but I mean, it's being a challenge. We've got to decide which one's best. Gino, you being the expert, it's down to you. Well, let me say, the breakfast is cooked perfectly, but we are in the middle of fields here, and, uh, you know, this is much more impressive. When you took the leaves off, I was thinking, no, nah, there is a trick somewhere. It's impossible that you can cook something like this outside. This has got the, you know, the wow factor, and that's what, uh, what is, for me, is a winner. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh, look at well that. done, Jason. Thank Physical you. and a cook after that. That's amazing. You can't beat that. And Gina, the ideal man. I am the ideal man. I've been trying to say this for years. <laughs> and old Gino De Campo, bless him, mm. he really, he was genuinely amazed by this piece of technology, and mm. that, I think, says it all. Amazing. Now it's time for the Wall of Fame. Each week on the Wall of Fame, we look at one particular area of gadgetry and choose the most iconic gadget from that category to join our Wall of Fame. Yeah, Otis and I decide on a particular gadget that we think has the assets to uh, merit a place on the esteemed wall. The best part of this is that four weeks in, Jason is yet to record a single victory. Let me reiterate, not one of these iconic gadgets has been chosen by Jason. This week, though, I'm told confidence is high in the Bradbury camp because we're debating personal transport gadgets. Jason is championing the Sinclair C5 against Otis's Segway. Here's my candidate, the legendary Segway. A bit like Girls Aloud. It's not for everybody, but once you've had a go, do you know what I mean? The Segway's American inventor, Dean Kamen, decided to create this zippy alternative to the car because he wanted our cities to be faster, cooler and cleaner. But before the Segway was launched, nobody had a clue what he was planning. There were rumours it was going to be bigger than the internet and even that it was going to be able to fly. When the Segway was revealed on an American TV show in December 2001, people realised they'd been led to expect a bit much. Obviously, it couldn't fly, but it was still a stunning bit of kit. Segways have five gyroscopic sensors and a couple of accelerometers, so they can glide along at 12 miles per hour. That's three times faster than walking. They measure your lean angle 100 times a second and tell the electric motor exactly how much power to apply to keep you upright. It's incredibly clever, but once you get used to it, remarkably intuitive. Think about how complicated walking is. Right foot up, right foot forward, right foot down, grip. Repeat with the left leg. Way too difficult. Now, a lot of people think the Segway is possibly a little over-engineered as an alternative to walking, but it has caught on with certain groups. Which is why the Chicago police force used them, and also why the Swedish bomb squad has recently ordered a batch. Oh, and posh golfers use them too to get about the course. But that's not really that cool, so forget that, John. Logically, we should all be gliding around on segways, but unfortunately in Britain and many other places around the world, they're not road legal. This, plus a price tag of over £4,000, has meant they've never really caught on. But because the segway is clearly the coolest and most innovative way of travelling since the car, it fully deserves a place on the wall of fame. As far as alternatives to walking go, in my opinion, the Segway has a problem. You've got to stand on it to make it work. That's not the case with this, the Sinclair C5. It looks even more futuristic than the Segway, but was invented way back in 1985 by the legendary British inventor Clive Sinclair. After several false starts, the C5 was finally born in 1985 when Clive struck a deal with Lotus to tweak its design and build a prototype. He also enlisted the help of another famous British company, Hoover, to make the plastic moulded body. Because Segways don't have pedals, they're not classed as bikes, and they're obviously not cars, so they're illegal to use on British roads. 
the C5 has got pedals, as well as an electric motor, which means you can drive them on any road. So, I legally get to tell you exactly what it's like. It's bigger than the Segway, but it's about the same weight, 50 kilograms. And that's on account of its lightweight Hoover bodywork. It'll travel between 12 and 15 miles an hour and go 20 miles on one charge, which is pretty impressive. And I reckon it's a steadier ride than that wobbly Segway. It's got a 250-watt motor made by an Italian company called Polymotor. And yes, the rumours that they make washing machine engines are true, but they also make torpedoes. People with no sense of adventure said the C5 was dangerous because it was so low down in the road, and they moaned about its lack of gears and uncomfortable seating position. It's their fault that only 17,000 were ever sold and that production lasted only eight months before the company went into receivership. But while Otis's daft handlebar and wheels cost over £4,000, this fully roadworthy C5 costs just £400. That's why it deserves a place on the wall of fame. It's cheap, it's fun, it's eco-friendly. And it was invented by a British man called Clive. Right, gentlemen, that looked like a huge amount of fun. Great. However, I've got a couple of questions for you both, starting with you, Jason. <laughs> C5, 25 years on, started with this huge ambition years ago to be a serious personal transport device, has ended up really just as a bit of fun, a bit of a joke, even. What? Hey? <laughs> That's almost unpatriotic, what you just said. No, I, w I wouldn't say that, um, you know, you should push this as a practical means of going to and from work. Certainly not. John, it is a bit of fun. It's like a dancing toy robot, you know. <laughs> um, you marvel at the engineering and the design, but really, ultimately, it's a bit of fun, and that's why I'm so passionate about the C5. And notice the Segway was supposed to be so big it was going to rival the internet, and yet you hardly see one in Britain anyway. OK, so it's not as successful as they wanted it to be, but over 1,000 law enforcement agencies globally use these, and you'd see them more in the UK if the government would make them road legal. Ooh, this is a, it's a tricky decision. You've got, the, you've got the lovely British charm of the C5 versus the not quite as popular as it was supposed to be, but still fun <laughs> Segway. Ooh, um, and I think the winner really is quite obvious, the Segway. Yay! Because the, the concepts in there are so much more sophisticated, it's so much more inventive, it is actually useful. And for those two reasons, the Segway deserves its place on the Gadget Show's Wall of Fame. <laughs> Welcome back, and it's time now for the finale of this week's Wales Challenge. And the finale this week allows these two lovely boys <laughs> to dress up in all kinds of camouflage oh, yeah. and be butch and all sorts of oh, nice yeah. stuff. Do you know what? I am so partial to a bit of camo and a bit of butchness. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important that we remember there was some serious testing going on. We wanted to find out what the best gadget torch on the market is. And I went with this big baby. And I was armed with this. <laughs> <laughs> My big brute is the Wolf Eyes Shark, made of aircraft-grade aluminium. It packs a bright 24-watt beam. My Nightcore R2 Extreme may be small, but it's the most powerful compact LED torch around. Designed for special forces, it's tiny, but it's certainly no lightweight. <laughs> now, in order to test your torches, I've prepared some night ops, gentlemen. And the first test will be a test of distance, how far the beam of your torch will travel. Out there are two sets of three numbers. You've got to read those numbers using your torchlight, because those numbers apply ah. to the combination of a lock on top of a bin here. You've each got your own bin. If you get the numbers wrong, you'll be fired at by a load of angry paintballers. If you get them right, you'll be able to open the lock, open your bin, and get your toolbox. Why do you need a toolbox? Well, that's for the next task, which is to assemble that bar stool there by the light of your torch. Once you've assembled your bar stool, it's then a race to the finish. Ah! First person to reach the finish line is the winner, and also, therefore, the person who has the best torch. We dropped into night vision mode to film them, but the only light Jason and Otis could see was coming from their torches. With everything in place, it was time to get going with the first test, the range of the torches. Three, two, one, go! Leaping into action, we both headed for our start positions, after taking a moment to find the numbers. It soon became apparent that Jason had the superior range. What I have got on this brilliant torch is the ability to focus the lion. 
I saw the 358 combination no problem, even though it took about 30 seconds for my shark to warm up as it uses an HID bulb, a new type of bulb that heats up gases and salts to create a super bright plasma. I put in the combination and I was on to test two. How easy the torches are to handle. I was struggling with my night core. It uses a brand new high powered LED to create a really focused beam, but it's nine times less powerful than Jason's. I can't see the numbers. And I couldn't make my mind up what I was seeing. I thought it was 357. But it wasn't. It was 358, and I got shot in the backside as a result. Fire! Oh, it put me right on my cheek, that did. I couldn't afford to waste any more time, so I had to get closer to the numbers to see them. Oh, 358 it was one digit out. Otis's troubles have given me a decent head start on this test, but if you need to fix something in the dark with only a torch for light, chances are you're going to need as much freedom of movement as possible, which was a distinct advantage for Otis. This is great. I can actually keep... This is great. I can actually keep working with the torch in my mouth so I don't have to keep moving it with my hand. While I struggled on with my bulky shark, Despite being one of the most compact HID torches around, it's still 25 centimetres long and weighs a whopping 760 grams. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. See, my torch may be less easy to use than Otis's. It's so powerful that I can flood the entire area with light. With my night course handleability, I was gaining on him. It's less than 10 centimetres long and it only weighs 62 grams. And I was ploughing through the flat pack. After about 20 minutes, Jason finished the bar stool. Yeah. But with my night course tiny size enabling me to work hands-free, I caught up, finishing just a few seconds later. Ah! Me too! <laughs> there was no time to waste as we headed on to the final section. But John had arranged one final trial for us. In order to test the spread of our torches' beams, we each had to strap them to a paint gun. We had to use the paint guns to knock out a team of angry paintballers hidden along our route. If our torches weren't good enough, it would mean a long and painful journey to the finish line. I was wearing the black hat. Otis was in the white. With our torches strapped to our guns, we prepared for battle. As I finished the stool build first, I headed onto the battlefield with a five-second head start, but I was immediately pinned down. Otis arrived on site not long after. And although this was supposed to be a race to the finish, we decided to work together in a bid to just survive the onslaught of paint. And working together really helped. My shark had an adjustable beam from 4 to 16 degrees, changing it from a spotlight to more of a floodlight. We need a greater arc. If you can give me an area where they are, then hopefully I can jump up and get it. By spreading the beam, I dissipated some of the shark's light, but it was still plenty bright enough for this close quarters battle. The shark's wider beam helped us pick off a few more ballers. You are a goner, my son! Pick down the beam of my torch! Then we got pinned down in cover. <laughs> we were all taking a pounding, torches included, but they are designed to be tough. My shark is made from aircraft aluminium and is splash-proof. But my night core is the tough guy here. Made from a military-grade alloy, it's waterproof and drop-proof. It's also got a self-defense strobe feature that I used to distract the ballers just long enough for us to take out another one. There was one baller left, and the end was in sight. Jason, look, there's the button, just there. We spotted him in the torchlight, and with the adrenaline flowing, we went for glory. <laughs> we burst forward. Jason picked out the paintball with his wide beam while I went for the button. It was over! <laughs> We've done it! <laughs> it's so painful. I've never ever done paintballing and that looks sore. Do you get bruises? No, absolutely. You get welts. No. Yeah, it stings big time. However, we didn't experience as much pain as we dished out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but it was all about the torches. Yeah. Um, and Ooh. it always, it was, it was kind of neck and neck, but we decided to check your battery power. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, full power. Yours lasted 55 minutes. Oh. Small, two hours, ten. Small but mighty. Exactly. Oh. window, my friend. <laughs> you know what? That's a very good point. I mean, this is an amazing torch. You can light up a football field with this thing. Yeah. But it has a payoff in battery power, doesn't it? Yeah, and trying to look at things at a distance was like trying to read Morse code. Yeah, yeah, but that's a really practical torch for everyday use. Thank you very much. Uh, having said that, though, you did win that part of the challenge, yep. but if a math serves me correctly, I won the first two, which means I'm the winner! <laughs> 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 
Fantastic. <laughs> On Jason's celebratory <laughs> note, we'll see you next time. See ya. See you, bye. <laughs> <laughs>